Welcome to Wisdom Trek with Grams. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, and we are on day 2111 of our trek to create a legacy of wisdom, to seek out discernment and insights, and to boldly grow where few have chosen to grow before. Today we are continuing with our ongoing series of messages that I delivered at Putnam Congregational Church over the past couple of years. This series of messages will cover the Sermon on the Mount as recorded in Matthew chapter 5 through 7. I pray that it will be a conduit of learning and encouragement for you today. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, kids. I appreciate it. I think I'll just quit preaching and just let the children's sermon be enough for us. I do appreciate the ladies that are helping out, and, and anyone that wants to assist with children's messages, and it just doesn't have to be women, um, you're certainly welcome to get in touch with Paula, and we'll work you in the, the schedule. Thank you, kids. And Luke comes in every, every week and sits down here with me at front. I think I'll just let him start preaching. I think he'll he'd probably do, do us a good job. So, Do you welcome everyone here today. As we look at the Sermon on the Mount, once again, this is our ninth in the series. It's hard to believe we've had nine lessons on the Sermon on the Mount already, but we have. And it looks like we'll have a couple more this, um, in this series. So that'll take us through the end of July, and then we'll look at something else as we start in um, with August. And today's passage is a Christian's relationship, judging others, and effective prayer. And it's taken from Matthew chapter 7. Verses 9 through 12, or I'm sorry, chapter 7, verses 1 through 12, and it is on page 1505 in the Pew Bible, and I will be reading the New International Version today, so you can follow along with the Pew Bible if you want to. And it says, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way that you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take that speck out of your eye, when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give the dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be open. Which of you, if a son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So in everything, do to others what you would have them to do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. As I mentioned, this is a ninth series, and if you happen to miss any of the the messages, they are on our church website at putnamchurch.org or on the Facebook page. So you're welcome to go back and catch up if you've missed any in this series. But Matthew 7 consists of several self-contained paragraphs. They link, the link to each other is not really apparent. Nor does the chapter of the whole follow along with the previous two chapters in the Sermon on the Mount. In the first chapter 5 and 6, there was some, a sequence of events that we went through during that. And this is broken during 7, but however... Connecting the thread that runs through chapter 7, however loosely, is that of relationships. It would seem quite logical that Christ, after teaching us about Christian's character, the influence, righteousness or right living, holiness and ambition, now he wants us to concentrate finally on our relationships. And there are several relationships we're going to, to look at today. The Christian counterculture is not individualistic. Now, we talked about the counterculture where we're to turn today's culture upside down because then it will be right side up in God's kingdom. But it's not an individualistic thing that we do. It's a community. The Christian counterculture requires all of us working together. 
relations within a community between the citizens of God's kingdom and those who are not yet citizens of his kingdom. And that's of overriding importance today. Matthew 7 deals with seven networks of relationships into which we, Jesus draws his followers into. We will focus on the first four this week and the remainder over the next two weeks. So the seven relationships are to our fellow citizens of God's kingdom, verses 1 through 5, to a group that is surprisingly, Jesus calls them dogs and pigs. That's verse 6, and to our heavenly Father, verses 7 through 11, and then to everyone in general, which we refer to as the golden rule, and that's verses, verse 12. In the next couple weeks, we'll cover our relationship to fellow citizens of God's kingdom in a little bit different angle, verses 13 and 14, to false prophets, verses 15 through 20, and then back to Jesus our Lord in verses 21 through 27. So let's first look at our attitude to our fellow citizens of God's kingdom, verses 1 through 5. Jesus does not anticipate that the Christian community will be perfect. He knows that we'll have problems individually and among our community, whether it's here at Putnam as a local community or the wider community of believers. But the first thing he wants to point out to us here is the Christian is not the judge. Jesus' words, do not judge others or you will be judged, is very well known to us and often misunderstood and sometimes misquoted. Judgment within the court of law, and I couldn't find a gavel, so we'll use our meat tenderizer today. If I was a judge on the bench, I would have authority to proclaim a sentence. And that's done by pounding on the, the gavel, with the gavel. But in our personal lives, our Lord's injunction is do not judge others. And it cannot be misunderstood, though, that we have a refusal to, to, to discern truth from error or goodness and evil. How can we be sure that Jesus is not referring to us not being discerning? Well, partly because it would not be honest but hypocritical if we behaved in this manner. We know from this and other passages that God's love for integrity and his hatred for hypocrisy and that humans are created as imagers of God, which includes our ability to make value judgments. We can know the difference between right and wrong. Christ's teaching on the Sermon on the Mount is based on the assumption that we will, or indeed should, use critical thinking to determine on how to live right for ourselves. We have to develop a righteousness or a right living that exceeds the right living or righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Our right living should exceed the world standard, and we should adopt a standard of love for others. We are not to be like the hypocrites with our right living or like the heathens with their ambition. How can we possibly obey the teachings unless we can first evaluate the performance of others in comparison to what we should li live like to make sure that our lives are in line with God's word? If then Jesus was neither abolishing the law courts nor forbidding us critical thinking, what does Jesus really mean here when he says, do not judge? The followers of Jesus do have the powers of discernment, but not to judge in the sense of being overly critical of others. Blindly judging others is a compound sin consistent, consisting of several unpleasant ingredients. The appeal in this passage is not to be a fault finder who is negative and destructive toward other people, or somebody who enjoys actively finding other people's failings. And we, I think we, all of us have run across people like that. And we're not to be a person who gleefully hunts out the faults of others while completely ignoring our own faults. And worse than that, to be a fault finder is to set yourself up as superior or judge. You're saying, I'm the judge of this court, and I condemn you. But that's not what Christ means here. To claim the competency and authority to sit in judgment of other Christ followers, and when we do so, we usurp the prerogative of the divine judge God. 
and you're taking a role that's only reserved for God. Not only are we not to judge, but we are among those who are being judged. And Christ says in this passage that we shall be judged with a greater strictness ourselves if we insist on judging others. We are to be critical thinkers without being overly critical. The plea is to be generous when dealing with others. And that takes us to verses 3 and 4, that Christians are not to be hypocrites. Jesus tells us now this famous little parable about foreign bodies in people's eyes. The speck of sawdust. I was out using the chainsaw yesterday, cutting this huge log up, and I just Sawdust was flying all over the place. I got it in my mouth, I got it in my ears, up my nose and my ears, everywhere. And you can tell you that speck of sawdust can cause some irritation. But the speck of sawdust is compared to a plank in our own eyes. So here's the reason why we're not fit to be judges. Not only are we fallible ourselves, and our, we are not God, so we're not the ultimate judge. It's also because we're fallen humans. The fall in the Garden of Eden made all of us sinners. So we're in no position to stand in judgment of our fellow sinners, and we're disqualified from the bench. God has taken the gavel from us and put it down for himself. The picture of someone struggling with the delicate operation of removing a speck of dirt in someone else's eye while a plank covers their own eye is ludicrous. It's almost comical. And I brought my friend along with me today, Mr. Balloonhead. He's a good buddy of mine. And I notice that Mr. Balloonhead has this speck of sawdust in his eye. And I say, I see, Mr. Balloonhead, that you have some sin in your life, some problem that you need to deal with. Let me help you deal with your problem, Mr. Bloonhead. Oh, let me get you here. I can help you. Yes, I can point out all your faults. Here we go. Oh. And what happens? We destroy other people by trying to fix their problems when we're not willing to fix our own. When we still have the plank in our eyes, we can't see, how can we ever help someone else fix their problems? The Christian instead is to be a friend. Our Christian duty is not to see the speck in our friend's eye, while at the same time, not to notice the plank that we have in our own eye. The standard that Jesus for relationships in a Christian counterculture is to be high and healthy. Our attitudes and behaviors toward others, we play neither judge by becoming harsh, judgmental, or condemning, nor we are, are we a hypocrite by blaming others while excusing ourselves, saying, you got sin in your life, fella, but they don't, you don't see our own plank or log in our own eyes. Instead, we are to be a friend, caring for others so much that we first blame and correct ourselves and then seek constructively to help others when they come to us and say, I'm really struggling with this issue. Can you help me? Then it's okay, once we've removed the planks from our own eyes, to go and help our fellow Christian to remove that speck of sawdust that they may have in their eye. And that takes us to the next paragraph. And these seem somewhat disjointed, but I think you'll see the tie in here. And this is our attitude to dogs and pigs. Now, I can't say that I'm a real dog lover, and certainly not a pig lover. I enjoy dogs all right, but at this stage in our season of our life, it's not for, for us. Well, first sight and hearing the startling language from the lips of Jesus, especially sitting there on the, on the mount teaching, and he brings up about dogs and pigs. And this comes immediately after he's already told us not to judge other people but other people are our fellow believers. Nevertheless, the context provides a healthy balance. If we are not to judge others, finding fault with them as being judgmental, condemning, or a hypocritical way, we cannot ignore the faults 
either or pretend that there is no sin among anybody. Both extremes, both extremes are to be avoided, though. The saints are not judges, but the saints are also not simpletons. If we first remove the log from our own eye, we can see clearly to help our friend who's come to us for help with the speck in their eye. They will appreciate our kindness, but not everyone is grateful for criticism and, and correction. And according to the book of Proverbs, this is one of the apparent distinctions between a wise person and a foolish person. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 8 says, So don't bother correcting mockers, which means fools. They will only hate you. But correct the wise, and they will love you. But what does Christ mean when he talks about these dogs and pigs and giving them these names? And Jesus is, not, is indicating that they're, not, they're more animal than they are human. And not only animal, they're animals with dirty habits. The dogs that he had in mind were not the well-behaved lap dogs of the aristocracy of the day that lived in elegant homes, but the wild pariah dogs, the vagabonds, the mongrels that scavengered in the city rubbish dumps. And the pigs, who were already unclean animals to the Jews, you think of a pig, they're slopping in mud and all sorts of gross stuff. So he was very distinct on his description here. But the New International Version, I think, clarifies it a bit. It says, don't waste what is holy on those who are, are unholy. Don't throw your pearls to pigs. They will trample the pearls and then turn and attack you. So these dogs and pigs, with whom are for, we are forbidden to share the gospel, because Christ says, don't waste what is holy on those that are unholy, these are unbelievers that have already had an opportunity and have been presented with the good news and they've decisively and even defiantly rejected it. They've made their choice. Of course, there's always hope with everyone and it's not up to us as believers to completely write off somebody. They may have turned and rejected God but our teaching here is that we focus our energies on those who are receptive to the gospel. Focus our time and energies on those that are willing to hear what you're, you have to say about Christ. The teachings of Jesus here is an exceptional situation only. Our standard as Christians is to be patient and persevere with others, as God has patiently persevered with us. Which takes us to our next paragraph, which is attitude to our Heavenly Father, verses 7 through 11. It seems that nat naturally that Jesus would move from our relationship with our fellow Christ followers to our relationship with the Heavenly Father and His divine grace with us. And Jesus makes some promises in these, these verses. The passage is not first, His first instruction of, about prayer on the Sermon on the Mount. This is actually His third instruction about prayer. Jesus has warned us against the Pharisaic hypocrisy and the pagan, pagan formalism, and he's even given us a model for prayer, the Lord's Prayer. Now, however, he actively encourages us to pray by giving us some very gracious promises. Jesus seeks to impress, imprint these promises on our minds and memories with hammer blows of repetition. First, he promises are attached to direct commands. And I like the New Living Translation on this because it shares the real heart of what this, this verse means. Verse 7, it says, Keep on asking, and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking, and you will find. Keep on knocking, and the door will be opened to you. Now, his second promise is, he expresses in a universal statement. He says, For everyone who asks, receives, Everyone who seeks, finds, and everyone who knocks, the door will be open. And thirdly, Jesus illustrates the promise of a simple and yet easy to understand parable in verses 9 through 11. He says, you parents, if your children ask you for a loaf of bread, do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. If you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask Him? 
So the force of the parable lies in contrast rather than comparison between God and parents. But nevertheless, there's no doubt that our prayers will be transformed when we grasp that God is our heavenly Abba Father, our Daddy Father, the dearest dad you could ever have in a, on this earth. That's what God is to us. He's infinitely good and infinitely kind. And we compare it to when your kids or grandkids ask you for things, do you always give in to them? No. They say, I want another candy bar. I've only had five. Do we give in to them? No, I want to stay up tonight until midnight. And yeah, I have school and I have to get up at six o'clock. Do you give in to them? No, we don't. And if we belong to Christ, God is our Father, we are His children. And prayer is coming to him with our request. The trouble is that many of us, too many of us, it seems too simple or even simplistic. We in our sophistication, we say we cannot believe. In any case, it does not altogether agree with our experiences. So we turn from Christ's prayer promises to our own prayer problems. Because whenever you have humans, you have problems. <clears throat> Confronted with the straightforward forward promises of keep on asking, you will receive what you ask for. It's like a child going, mommy, mommy, mommy. And they go, just won't let up, and you just get so tired of it. Or they keep on seeking. And keep in mind children playing hide and seek. And they'll seek for the longest time until they find the last person that's hiding. And when you hear knocking at your door, it brings us to our attention. But if somebody stood there and just continued to knock on wood, knock on your door and wouldn't cease, you would realize there's something wrong. So we raised several objections to prayer that I want to consider this morning. First of all, sometimes we say, well, prayer is unseemly. Jesus himself said earlier that our Heavenly Father knows what he, we need and cares for us anyway. Besides, you cannot really be bothered with my petty request. The question is not, are we ready? That is, is God ready to give to us? But the question is, are we prepared to receive what he has for us? So in prayer, we do not coerce God, but rather we learn to submit to God. But we might say, well, prayer is unnecessary. And this is our second objection. And it arises more from our experience than theology. Thoughtful Christians look around and see lots of people that are getting along fine without praying at all. Indeed, they seem to have and receive the same without prayer, the very things that we are asking for. They get what they want by working for it instead of praying for it. And we're tempted to say, well, this proves that prayer doesn't make an ounce of difference. It's so much wasted breath. But we fail to re remember that God gives all life and breath. He sends the rain from heaven and the fruitful season to all. He makes the sun rise on the evil and the good alike. None of these goods, these gifts are dependent on whether people acknowledge the creator or pray to him. But the more important gifts do. The gifts of redemption is different. God does not grant salvation to all alike, but to those who call upon him. Romans chapter 10, verse 13 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And the blessings are our post-salvation blessings, the good things which Jesus says he'll give to his children. It's not the material blessings that he's referring to here, but our spiritual blessings. The blessings include daily forgiveness, deliverance from evil, peace, and an increase in our faith, hope, and love. And most important is the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit as a comprehensive or all-consuming blessing of God. John chapter 15, verse 26 says, But I will send you the advocate, the spirit of truth. He will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. But there's one more problem we have with our prayer. We say, well, prayer is unproductive. I prayed to be healed, and my illness got worse. I prayed for peace in my family, 
and my spouse only gets worse. I pray for peace in the world, and we see the world filled with the noises of war. So prayer doesn't work. And this is the familiar problem with unanswered prayer. But perhaps we could put the matter in this way. Being a good, godly, heavenly father, he gives his only good gifts to his children. And being wise, he knows which gifts are good and which ones are not. So then, if we ask for good things, he grants them. If we ask for things which are not good for us, just like the kid wanting more and more candy, he would deny those to us. But the key is here in Grass's point. Only God knows the difference. What we think might be good, God knows the beginning from the end. He knows whether those would be good for us long term and for eternity. So the lessons that we want to learn before we ask, we must know what to ask for and whether is in relationship to God's word and God's will. We must believe that God can grant anything that we ask for if it's within his will. Then the gracious promises of Jesus will come true. And that takes us to our last paragraph, the last verse that we'll have today is our attitude to all people. We refer to this as, our, as the golden rule in verse 12. And we see that in verse 12 is the best known example of a correlation or parallelism between the Sermon on the Mount and the Jewish Talmud or law. Verse 12 says, do, no, do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets. And we need to compare this when Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 5, verse 14, the greatest commandment was, for the whole law can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. This command is a high standard because self-love is a powerful force. In fact, it's probably the most powerful force that we have dwelling in us is our love for self. In nearly every situation, self-advantage often guides us in our affairs. Now, we must also let it guide us in our behavior toward other people. All we have to do is to use our imagination a bit, put ourselves in the other person's shoes and ask, how would I like to be treated in this situation? And I mentioned at the beginning that Christian counterculture is not just an individual value system or lifestyle. It's a community affair. We as citizens of God's kingdom are to work together with the same attitude. It involves relationships. The Christian community is, in essence, a family. It's the family of God. And that's what we are here today. So in Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 12, Jesus introduces us to these fundamental relationships. At the center is our relationship with our Heavenly Father, God whom we come to and we depend on, and who never gives his children anything other than good gifts for their lives. We may not understand them to be good. We may think that's horrible, that I lost a loved one. But we don't fully understand the whole arc of that, what it will bring about. We have to understand that he does bring us good gifts. And next is our relationship with our fellow believers. If our fellow Christians are indeed fellow, fellow citizens of God's kingdom, it's like we in America are citizens of America. We're here for a common purpose within our country. A much higher calling to that is being citizens of God's kingdom. It's inconceivable that we shall be anything other than caring and constructive in our attitude toward our fellow believers. So as we wrap it up today, let me leave you with this thought. Let us put ourselves sensitively into the other person's place and desire for them what we would choose for ourselves. And if we can do this, we will never be mean, but always generous. We'll never be harsh, but always understanding. We'll never be cruel, but always kind. 
And those are the lessons Christ is teaching us in the first 12 verses of Matthew chapter 7. The relationships that are so valuable in our lives, both to God and to our fellow believers, and to even those that are outside our community of believers. Next week, we're going to talk about a narrow gate, some fruit, and true disciples. So you want to join us next week as we continue on in our series on the Sermon on the Mount. So let us pray. Father, we do thank you for your goodness. We thank you that we can come to you, that we can ask, and you will provide. We can seek, and we will find. And we can knock, and you'll open the door widely for us. But we also realize that these are good gifts that you give us, Father, not what we think is good for us. And help us in all things to put ourselves in the other person's shoes and ask, how would I like to be treated in this situation? Help us to have this attitude, Father, and before you, a pure heart to live a life that's pleasing to you and according to your word of what you are teaching us here. In this I pray moment. that this message was a blessing and a time of learning from God's word. Thank you so much for allowing me to be your guide, your mentor, but most importantly, I am your friend as I serve you through the Wisdom Trek podcast and journal each day. And as we take this trek of life together, let us always live abundantly, love unconditionally, listen intentionally, learn continuously, lend to others generously, lead with integrity, and leave a living legacy each day. I am Guthrie Chamberlain, reminding you to keep moving forward, enjoy your journey, and create a great day every day. See you next time for more wisdom from God's Word.